Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. Thanks for letting me know, giving me a heads up. Yeah, you got it. Let me just restart this here. All right, so you can see me and you can see my screen. Yep, you're uh, you're good to go. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Victor. So uh, pretty much like Victor said, I was a personal trainer. Um, that's how I found chiropractic. And then um, I saw that there was a better way to basically work out the body and keep the body together. So as you guys are in school right now, you're probably learning about all these different muscles, you know, like just being very, very general, but the pec is here, right? And then you got the deltoid and then you got the lat and you got the core and you kind of learn them as like separate entities. Um, and that's like the exact same way that people rehab them and train them in the gym, right? Monday's chest day, Tuesday's shoulder, uh, Wednesday's legs, you know, Thursday's core, Friday's arms. And they create these uh, invisible divides in the body. Um, and that's not actually how the body works. There, there is no separation between these muscles in the body. And treating them like they are separate causes harm because um, we're basically not using the body as one cohesive unit, um, if that makes sense. Also, you guys can feel free to like interrupt or, or ask any questions. Um, like I said, I, I don't like people lecturing at me, so I'll try not to do that too much, but all I'm trying to say here is the way that we've looked at the body before as individual muscles, the quad, um, you know, separate from the hamstring, separate from the rest of the body, it, it creates a, a way of looking at the body that is too, um, too individualized and it doesn't actually treat the whole problem holistically, right? Um, well, I have a question. So, yeah. What's up? What oh, what's your name? oh, Alvin. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Hey, Alvin. How are you? Or what's your question? Oh, my question is when you say causes harm, are you saying like, if you work out these individual, uh, body parts in the long term, it's going to have a adverse effect on your health? Yeah. Yeah. Because you're, you're pretty much isolating a muscle that is part of a whole chain. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. Um, but there's these things called fascial lines that encompass many multiple muscles across multiple joints. And the old way of looking at the body is like, here's the quad. It's a leg extensor. That's what it does. It's not actually accurate to us using our quads day to day in the gait cycle, playing basketball, playing baseball. Um, it's just a very isolated way of looking at one muscle that doesn't look at how is that muscle contributing to the whole body's functions. So if, if you train it like that, if you train it isolated from everything else, um, you're treating like one spoke of the wheel uh, as, as the main unit and you're missing like this whole thing, if that makes sense. Okay. Well, uh, I, I'll, I'll elaborate on it a little bit. Um, oh. But basically what I'm saying is this way of looking at the body and isolated units that you add up and add up and add up and it creates the whole body. Um, it's a very outdated way of looking at the body and it's, you know, not, uh, it's really not accurate. Um, so in order to really understand that, I guess I'll, I'll jump ahead just slightly, but you really got to understand this thing called uh, fascial lines. So this is a book by um, Thomas Myers. It's called Anatomy Trains. You guys might have heard of it, um, but pretty much, like I said, the muscles in the body don't work in isolation. They work uh, together as cohesive units and they work in chains. So let's, let's stick with the quad example here. Um, on this skeleton, this is uh, what is called your superficial front line. So your superficial front line is a chain of muscles that uh, produce flexion in the body, right? So you can see that here you have the quad, you have the anterior tibialis, you have the rectus femoris, and, or uh, you have the rectus abdominis. Um, and basically this group of muscles works together to produce flexion. So if you produce um, knee extension um, with just the quad, then you're not really getting the whole, the whole picture. Right. Because um, it's almost like, you know, when a clown has uh, 
those long balloons and they twist off sections and create this like dog or this like flower, but it's all one balloon. That's really how your muscles are set up. They're set up in these long fascial chains with individual links that are muscles, but it's all part of one long chain, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, totally. You're, you're welcome, Alvin. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, you know, several different fascial lines. This is the superficial back line. Um, this in a baby produces extension. Uh, this is the superficial front line that produces flexion. These are your lateral lines um, and they produce lateral bending. And then here you have your spiral lines. Both of these are spiral lines here. And then you have your functional lines and then uh, your, uh, your deep front line. And you can see like pretty much these tracks of muscles span across joints, multiple joints, but they connect muscles that would otherwise not be connected, right? Like uh, the, the, the calf is connected to the hamstring, is connected to the erectors, and they work as one cohesive unit. When one contracts, it shortens the whole chain, right? Same thing with like the lat and the glute. As one lat contracts, it basically pulls towards the opposite glute. And that creates this like contralateral, um, you know, like relationship. Does that make sense? Uh, so th this is actually a more accurate way of looking at the body. Uh, Cause like I said before, it's not split up into these tiny little individual units. You can't just add up, um, you know, like, all, all the reps in your arm, in your bicep, and then add up all the reps in your deltoid and then add up all the reps in your pec and expect them to actually work together. You kind of have to work them all together at the same time. Um, so that's, that's, that's what's fascial lines and it's put together with uh, what's called fascia. I know you guys are learning a little bit about it and I'm super stoked about that because in school we barely learned about it, but it's so important. Um, and if you guys don't know what fascia is, it's basically uh, connective tissue that connects, uh, you know, muscles to other muscles. It connects organs together. Uh, it connects, um, you know, ligaments to bones. And it basically encompasses the whole body in this fibrous network, right? And it like separates the layers between muscles, right? So here's like uh, your external oblique that's joining with the fibers of the internal oblique on a separate level. And there's, there's no real separation between the two. So if you try to train them separately, uh, you're creating like, you're creating a division in your mental space that doesn't actually exist in your body. All right. So that's, that's fascia. So fascia looks like this, you know, underneath the dermis, underneath the layer of fat, connecting that to the muscle layer, you have some fascia, you have uh, fascia, you know, between the layers of muscles, um, it's holding all this stuff together, right? You have uh, fascia in your meninges uh, protecting you and it's, it's pretty much all over your body. So, you know, these, this fascia, these fascial systems are organized into the fascial lines and those fascial lines span across many, many joints and encompass many muscles and they produce um, you know, these chains, right? And so um, that's one way that I look for and analyze the body. Um, like, for example, if you have a, a trigger point that's represented by the X right here, um, I'm going to expect that there's going to be, you know, some pain and tenderness at the X, but I'm also going to expect that I'm going to have reduced uh, extension on the backside of this person because this trigger point here is basically shortening this whole line, right? And it's gonna make it really hard to extend because on the front side, it's that trigger point is winding up that entire band, right? Like a crazy thing that I uh, do for a lot of people um, that have like anterior head carriage, you know, students, you know, have are, are uh, plagued with this. People who work at desks are plagued with this. And a lot of times they'll try to like, do some neck retractions and, and bring their head back. But what's a really, really good thing to do is releasing the quads, releasing the quadriceps, uh, releasing the rectus abdominis with like a myofascial tool. And you'll feel your head have so much more room to actually like, to actually pull back and retract naturally. 
because uh, let me get back in the camera because let's say I have an adhesion right here. It's pulling my head down, pulling my head down. And even though I try to retract, I, I still get this tension here, right? But if I release the fascia here, release the fascia on my quad, now it's no longer pulling my head forward, right? Does that make sense, guys? I, I hope it does. Yes, but thank you. Yeah, totally. So that that's how I like, you know, we do a lot of like palpation analysis. We do gait cycle analysis. Um, but when I palpate for people's like range of motion and I, and I like see how they're moving, I can pretty much tell, you know, which fascial lines are limited because I know how they're connected. Um, going on, I, I always bring it back to um, the central nervous system and the brain, right? Because all other systems got to plug into the central nervous system in order for them to be online. Um, and that's, that's pretty much how I approach the body. I always try to bring it back to the central nervous system and protecting the brain, protecting the spinal cord and making sure that, um, you know, people are in as much balance as possible. Um, so this is um, an example of a fascial line that is kind of fun to, to trace because uh, it's just pretty wild what it does, but this is uh, the spiral line in your body. So it starts behind your mastoid, like let's start on your right side mastoid, and it's gonna swoop down on the back of your neck and then sweep over to your left uh, rhomboids, right? As it's sweeping over to your left rhomboids, it's gonna sweep around to your left serratus, and it's gonna go around the front side of your serratus on your left, and then it's gonna sweep over and basically become your external and internal oblique. So it starts on the, the back of your right neck down to the, the middle of your neck, your left rhomboid, your left serratus. And then now we're on the front side of your lower rib cage. And that lower rib cage is gonna sweep across back to your right side um, pelvis uh, slash hip, right? So just continuing to follow that down. The same balloon, uh, quote unquote, is going to sweep over your, your pelvis and then become your TFL and your IT band. And then it's gonna go down the side of your knee and basically become the anterior tibialis and then sweep uh, underneath the arch of your foot and then around to the outside of your uh, uh, peroneals and then up um, the lateral hamstring. And then that lateral hamstring becomes part of the erectors and then it inserts back on uh, the nuchal ridge. Right. So it's like a pretty wild journey for this like chain of muscles to stabilize your body in this spiral motion. Right. Like um, we'll, we'll, we'll see in a couple minutes um, these spiral chains in action. And these motions in sports are so complicated and there's so much going on. Uh, it's actually it's it's difficult to isolate like one single muscle that's being used because that's not actually how it works, right? All the muscles are almost always being used uh, in one way or another. It's just about which muscles are being accentuated uh, in that particular motion. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. So you guys um, have maybe, maybe not heard the idea of tensegrity. Uh, tensegrity is broken down into tension integrity, right? So that basically means uh, your body, your bones are floating in a sea of tension that is held up by your fascia, your muscles, your ligaments, you know, all of the, the soft tissue that is supporting the hard tissue that creates uh, tensegrity. And um, that's what biotensegrity is, right? So this is a good example of what it does for your body. It basically gives your body the ability to be elastic, strong, uh, you know, capable of, uh, you know, adapting to damage and recoiling. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's a much better, uh, it's a much better form than it is a compression structure, like a, like a old school building, like a brick building. That's a straight up compression structure your body, if it was built up like a, like a building, then 
then it would make more sense to train it in isolated parts. But because it's not a compression structure strictly, it's a tensegrity structure, then it makes it, it makes more sense to train it uh, holistically, right? Um, so tensegrity, uh, you know, utilizes fascia, it utilizes the muscles, the ligaments, um, and it's not just your, your, you know, large body on a macro scale, uh, the cells actually respect tensegrity physics. Um, so there's this term called mechanotransduction. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but basically um, the cells are producing electricity based off of the mechanical stresses that are applied to them. And the mechanical stresses applied to the cell, to a stem cell, for example, will shift that cell into specializing for a specific job. So the amount of tension in the cell, in the cellular, cellu, cellular, excuse me, cellular membrane will produce a different specified cell based off of the tensegrity, based off of, you know, the, the job devoted to that tensegrity um, tension, right? So it's pretty crazy. Like the, the rabbit hole goes really deep if you want to start talking about um, tensegrity and, and um, fascia and things like that. Okay, do you guys have any questions about that? That was like a super quick like run through of fascia, fascial lines uh, and tensegrity, but I want to get into some videos. Yeah, I had a quick question. Uh, so you mentioned that it's better to train your body holistically. Um, like I used to be a bodybuilder, so um, I would focus on specific segments to train on. Can you give maybe an example on what you mean by like holistically? Yeah, sure. Um, so pretty much uh, all the training that I do revolves around gait cycle. So it's all, um, it's all connecting your right arm to your left leg slash to your right leg. Uh, and it's related to throwing mechanics. So I'll give you examples with the videos, but I was uh, also like, I wasn't a pro bodybuilder or anything, but when I was younger, I was super fat and super overweight. And that's how you know, I found bodybuilding. I fell in love. I was like, man, I'm crushing these weights. I'm, I'm getting fit. I'm looking real good. Uh, I'm confident and I'm, I'm stoked. I did it for about 10 years. Um, and I did not focus on getting big. I just focused on quality form and reps. Um, and even still doing that, I hurt my back and that's how I found chiropractic. And so it was a blessing in disguise, but um, I totally like feel for you. I understand, like, I love it, um, but I'll, I'll show you some examples of training holistically. Uh, do you guys have any questions about, uh, you know, fascia, tensegrity, fascial lines? I have a question regarding like fascia. So yeah, with the reason some people are like less flexible than other people is because like their fascia is like more tighter and like some people have like more looser fascia. How does that go? Yeah. So I think it's important to distinguish between um, flexibility and mobility, right? Mm -hmm. Because some people are highly flexible without compromising uh, the end ranges of their joints. And then other people are extremely flexible slash hypermobile. And the, the end ranges of those joints have been compromised. Um, for, for example, like I'm not a super big fan of uh, stretching all the time and doing yoga like constantly because we found that it's much, much easier to stretch out something that's tight than it is to shorten something that's been overstretched. And that's what I find with a lot of yogis and, and people who do yoga every single day. You would think that their spines are awesome, right? But the, I haven't found that to be the case. I, I find that uh, because they're hypermobile, because they, they don't have stability where their body requires stability, and they have hypermobility where their body requires mobility, if that makes sense. Gotcha. So, so to answer your question, um, it's good to be flexible. It's good to be mobile where your joints are allowing for mobility, but at the same time, you also need stability where your body is requiring stability, right? Like you don't want to be hypermobile in your SI joint. 
right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You want you do want to be mobile in your hip socket, right? You do want to have mobility as your scapula glides on your rib cage, but you don't want to have hypermobility at the GH, right? And yeah. so it's a it's a very very careful line um, that I think a lot of people blur on the road to health by stretching everything. Like they think that something's tight, I gotta stretch. You know, <laughs> like that's that's not that's not a good approach in, in my opinion. Um, sorry, can I can I just ask one follow up question to that? Yeah, so if so if not stretching, right? If somebody does find that they do have restrictions in joints that should be mobile, for example, right in the scapula thoracic, right, or in your acetabular joint, right, where they should be more mobile then if not stretching, do you have them do some sort of like MFR techniques on it? Or like, what's like kind of like the baseline that you, that you give them before you put them through like these dynamic motions? Yeah. So I I typically (laughs) prescribe to them, you know, some light MFR um, just to get rid of trigger points in the body that are nodding up the fabric of the fascia. Right. Um, eventually you could even do like pnf stretching you could do um i, I know victor told me there was another term for it um but yeah it, it's skipping my my brain right so now. so for us it would be the equivalent of muscle energy pnf is the same thing that's what it's what pts basically call our do technique of muscle energy for anybody who doesn't know what gotcha. pnf is yeah gotcha yeah so you know if if you're if you're trying to account for a loss of range of motion in the joint, you have to identify if that loss of range of motion is at the joint level, you know, is that joint stuck, you know, then we would apply, you know, uh, a chiropractic adjustment or a, a manipulation, or you can look at the whole fascial chain to see, you know, is there um, anatomy that is restricting that range, right? And I don't know when's the last time you get you guys did my myofascial release on your quads or your hamstrings or your IT band or whatever, but it is unreal how much restriction we have in our body that we're trying to regain from joint manipulation that can be recovered from releasing uh, trigger points in the body, right? Awesome. So that, thank that, you. Yeah, totally. So. I still adjust people all the time. Um, I, but I want to make sure that, um, you know, not just are their muscles tight or loose, but, uh, do the fascial lines have, uh, nothing restricting their range of motion. And it is the, is that particular part of the chain getting a, a proper signal from the brain for proper activation. Right. And then also is the joint stuck? right? Because the, the, the stuck joint is going to produce that neurological blocking, the, the shortening of the fascia, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, we do have a question in the chat. So in, in the, in the DO practice, we, we learn this, um, technique called counter strain or strain counter strain. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it or if you guys have learned something similar to it. Um, but somebody was just asking if there was an equivalent to like P like a PT or like a Cairo, um, technique that would be similar to that. I have heard of it and I, um, don't know enough about it to be like, yeah, it's just like this. Um, but I think it's based off of the, the premise that the fascia can basically be fixated in a certain direction, right? And then you push it together and then you pull it apart after you push it together. Is that, is that what you guys? Yeah. So es- essentially, essentially what it is, is like, we're trying to find tender points. So not exactly trigger points, um, right? Trigger points are things that will radiate pain typically, right? When you're pushing on them, you can feel them radiate. So tender points, um, aren't supposed to radiate pain. And basically once you find this specific tender point, the idea is if you shorten the muscle or the, the tissue in that area while monitoring that point, it's supposed to help reset your, um, basically like your nociceptive and proprioceptive fibers that are going to your CNS. So that, um, when you take the person out of that 
uh, position of shortening, it, helps alleviate the pain and like the sympathetic response of like, basically like keeping that muscle engaged or taut. Um, yeah. So it's similar to what you were saying, but I think it's just more muscularly related. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. And I I would, uh, you know, I would maybe utilize something like that, uh, if I knew how to do it. Um, but it's definitely true that like, there's a tendency for, the restriction in the fascia or in the muscle to pull that chain in a direction, right? J- just like this, like a lot of people have extremely tight quads, extremely tight hip flexors, and that typically produces a, a shortening of that front chain, right? And you can see that in a lot of different people. And um, yeah, I'm sure if you did some strain, counter strain on that, it would help alleviate some of the pain and probably get a little bit of length back out of it. Uh, cool. These are great questions. I, I appreciate you guys asking the questions. And then uh, I think that's it in the chat right now. So I think if nobody else has anything, we can go on. Okay. Okay. Feel free to ask questions, guys. I'm going to move over to show you guys some videos because uh, I think that will explain a lot of like how to train in fascial lines or how to train holistically. Um. Okay, so I don't know about you guys, but this, you know, start of the year, I started playing a lot of golf because all the basketball courts were closed, um, but all the golf courses were open. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, Okay, cool, cool. So I'll show you what it means to basically like train holistically uh, by basically showing you all these different sports, right? Because you guys probably work with a lot of different types of athletes. It doesn't make sense to train all athletes from different sports in the same way if their goals are to produce uh, different movement patterns, right? So uh, this is Rory, Rory McIlroy. He has like one of the best swings in golf, in my opinion, because it's always like totally balanced. He's always in control. He could let it fly uh, and still be in control. But I just want to show you, um, I I also want to preface this by saying it really makes sense to train the body in spirals because as forces come through your body and you're redirecting those forces, they typically move in a spiral pattern. And I'll show you guys exactly what I mean. So basically in the backswing, as he opens up here, um, he's basically unwinding or he's basically winding his shoulders back this way. Right. So his whole body is rotating here and then he's putting a little bit of weight shift on that back leg. Right. Uh, As he unwinds, he's going to shift his pelvis forward away from us and he's going to put more weight on this front leg here. And then these spirals are going to open up back this way. Right. So let's go ahead and watch it here. He's going to unload and he's going to produce like He's basically unwinding those spirals, right? So he's gonna open up here. And then I want you guys to watch right here as he loads his leg here, his whole body will continue this spiraling motion here. Can you guys see that? How it's like, one cohesive unit um it's hard to tell like which muscle he's using right yep all right so there's there's a there's a a proper movement pattern to releasing spirals is is what i call it because you're basically building spirals on one side using you know the lat on on one side using the pec on the other side one side is pulling and one side is pushing and that creates this rotational torque. And when you release those spirals, you utilize the the flip version of that, right? Now you're using the right side pec and then the left side lat and that produces this this, uh, counter rotation, right? And just pay attention to how uh, his whole body is rotating to his left now. Remember before his whole body was rotating to his right, in the backswing and when he releases it 
Now the whole body moves left. All right, let's go ahead and watch it from this side. But this is a great angle to see the same exact thing. Uh, in the beginning, he, he's pretty balanced on both legs, right? But as he goes into the backswing, he'll shift his weight just slightly more to that rear leg. And just look at how much torque he's getting to this backside here. You're even getting just a little bit of internal rotation on that lead leg. And then, you know, guess what he's going to do? He's going to shift his weight back and he's going to release those spirals. And his whole body is going to rotate towards his left shoulder instead. So here, like, you see how this is a whole body movement? All right, so now he's planted here and his whole body is rotating this way. All right, let me show you guys another example of like, uh, I know this one uh, Victor's gonna like because he told me that he likes uh, the Dodgers and uh, so this one is Mookie Betts hitting and it's the same exact you know scenario you're basically shifting your weight and pivoting around this front leg here and he was already torqued back here right if he was about to that he was already torqued up to his right shoulder his back right shoulder and he's going to release those spirals and the whole body will pivot around this front foot right here See that? All right, so to me, um, going back to training holistically, I almost always train people in a unilater unilateral stance. And what I mean by unilateral is one side is in flexion and the other side is in extension. And I usually train with a lot of, um, you know, rotational exercises, thoracic rotation, uh, pelvic rotation, because we're seeing that that transfers a lot more to sports and it also keeps the body uh, more stable dynamically. Like if you, if you train the body in straight lines, it's not gonna work out well because there's, there's very, very few straight lines in movement. And so if your movement, if you're installing a straight line movement pattern, and then when it comes time to perform, your body is searching for rotation, you know, you're going to get hurt. Your, your, your adjustments aren't going to last. Uh, and the human body wasn't made to move in a straight line. Like it was made to actually rotate and spiral from one side to the other side. All right. So this is all based off of the, the premise that, um, humans were made to run, walk, uh, jump, and throw, right? As much as we love like squatting and deadlifting um, and a natural squat to like use the, use the bathroom where you see a baby squatting, that is totally natural. But I've never seen a baby do a rear loaded squat with, you know, 225 on his back, you know, at, to, to take a dump, right? Like, <laughs> um, but what we find is running, gait analysis, unilateral stance, cross body connection, throwing, same thing. That really um, like gives the body a special type of stimulus uh, that it really loves. So let's watch him again. So same thing, right? This is a cool view because all of his weight is on that back foot. Uh, he's pretty much torqued up this way. And you can tell, you can tell that by the angle of his shoulders, right? So what he's going to do is he's going to shift his weight over to this side. And then he's going to load this front leg. And then he's going to spiral around this front leg. And even the trail leg will begin to spiral inward. So the extended leg behind you, as it's gone into extension, it should go into internal rotation 
and that front leg in flexion should be in slight external rotation. So it's, it's very much like this. The front leg in flexion should go in external rotation, and then the trail leg in extension should be in internal rotation. So it's like this. So as you're running and as you're walking, it should move like this. So that's why I'm saying like, it doesn't make sense to train it in straight lines or train it in isolation like this, doing a whole bunch of leg presses with one leg and then doing a whole bunch of leg presses on this leg, right? It makes more sense to train them uh, in opposites. So let's see what he does. Right, can you guys see how he just like planted his front foot right here? And then you get a nasty, huge, you know, pelvic on femur rotation, right? And that basically delivers all this torque up the core, up the rib cage, up the shoulders. Uh, and you got to allow the extended leg to rotate as well, or else you're going to get a knee valgus on that extended leg and then risk, you know, catastrophic knee injury, right? And you can see him doing that really well. High level athletes um, do this consistently. Michael Jordan does this. Uh, Dustin Johnson does this. Mookie Betts does this. Uh, Tom Brady does this, uh, you know, and they all do a similar movement pattern because it's the most efficient. It's the most secure. Uh, it's the most powerful um, and it keeps them free of injury. Do you guys have any questions about this so far? We got nothing in the chat. Oh, I, I had a question. Uh, okay, go for it. Really. Uh, so Dr. Cow, you mentioned that uh, training the body in spirals helps like optimize performance. Uh, so how, do, how does that play a role in like, injury prevention? Yeah, so it's all based on, like I said, the premise that humans were made to run, walk, jump, and throw. So if your body has a design built into it to run and walk and jump and throw, and you're releasing these spirals as you're walking and you're running and you're jumping and you're throwing, it secures the joint in the way that the joints were aligned to, to be secured, if that makes sense. Like remember going back to, um, you need stability where your body is requiring stability. You need mobility where your body is requiring mobility. If you map that all out, it goes into this like beautiful spiral pattern. And so what I do is I look for um, aberrancies in those spirals. I adjust the joint where I feel like the joint needs to be adjusted. And then I stabilize the body in that spiral pattern. And that produces the best results that I can find because I'm basically giving the body what, what it wants, right? And it's, it's based off of something that goes so deep into like on a cellular, cellular level. I'm having a hard time with words today, but <laughs> it goes into the cells, right? Because all the cells are aligned in a specific tensegrity pattern that basically adds up to your whole body producing spirals. So like, uh, for example, um, like if somebody has a, a shoulder injury, right? I get a lot of shoulder injuries. I separated my shoulder and that's what led me down this whole path. But typically what people will do is they'll give them a lot of these like, like 90, 90 exercises, right? Like 90 here, 90 here, right? 90 here, 90 here. Um, and they're thinking that if you add up enough 90 degrees, you'll get this whole 180 but that's not actually how the, the body works, right? The, the GH is a ball and socket joint. It's a rotational joint. It's made for throwing. So if I stabilize their body in rotations, if I stabilize their body in spirals, and I can see where there's a, a hitch in their spiral based off of their throwing mechanics, then I can identify uh, which movement pattern they're lacking. Right. And then when I supply that movement pattern that their body is showing me that they are lacking, then I provide it to their body and then, then their joint feels secure and it feels strong and it feels stable. Thank you. Yeah, totally. 
So um, it'll probably be, oh, did somebody else have a question? Can I actually ask another question on top of that? You might have like already talked a little bit about it, but I was kind of curious if you've ever come across congenital variations. Like for instance, if you have a congenital variation in your shoulder labrum, like a Buford's complex, so the anterior portion of it's missing. And I'm curious if that alters the way that you approach your patient's treatment. Yeah, that's a great, great question because everybody is different, right? Everybody has these anatomical slight differences. Maybe some people have a, a large difference. Um, like some people are double jointed, I'm double jointed, um, but it doesn't change the way that I approach their body because I'm never trying to apply uh, what I think their body is capable of doing. I'm basically just coming to them with the premise that their shoulder, them being a human being, them having a ball and socket joint at the GH, them having a gliding motion in the scapula and the rib cage, them having thoracic rotation, them being a human being is enough for them to have a basic throwing mechanic, right? So I'm not expecting them to like throw the exact same way every single time, but I am expecting them to be able to perform a, just a basic throw. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. Thank you very much. Totally, totally. Yeah, a lot of people have, you know, differences, right? Like it doesn't matter how much I train somebody to throw, they may or may not be going to the, to the major leagues, right? You could do 10,000 reps. That doesn't mean that you're going to throw 100 miles per hour. Um, there's a lot that goes into that. But on a, on a cellular level, on a DNA level, we're really not that different, right? Like I could train somebody who doesn't speak English and they'll still have basic throwing mechanics just because they're a human being. I could train somebody from Russia, from Mexico, you know, as long as they're a human being, their shoulder is going to be designed to throw. As long as they're a human being, they should have um, relatively similar gait cycle because we all, you know, are, are so closely, we're pretty much the same for them on the big grand scheme of things. We're really, really not that, that different. Um, so I don't approach it too different. Um, what I will say is like, I do be extra careful with people who have had like surgeries, um, you know, who've blown out ligaments and they've had to get it, uh, grafted, right. You got to be a little bit more careful because, you know, it's just the nature of things, but I still take them through the, the throwing mechanics. I still take them through gate cycle, um, because from, from where I work from humans, if you're a human, you were made in your DNA, in your genetic coding to run, walk, jump, and throw. And I haven't really found anybody that uh, is exception to that. Hey, Dr. Kelly, I had a follow-up question to that statement you just made. Uh, what about if someone comes in that's like a rock climber or something, like you don't really do that much throwing motions or like even walking motions, how would you go about like treating them or working with them? Totally. So I still treat them the exact same. I still treat them the exact same because even though they're not doing a lot of um, rock or not a lot of running or swinging a bat or throwing their shoulder is craving for the stability of a of a 360 um you know stability right they're probably i have a couple of rock climbers um who are you know crazy about it and they have like extremely extremely tight um you know biceps uh forearms wrists and they get a lot of pain in the front of their shoulder so what I teach them to do is I teach them to reverse throw. So, so this, is, this is basically a normal throw, right? Like I'm throwing a football behind my head here and a reverse throw would be just the opposite. So I'm reversing it. And basically what this does is it stabilizes the, the rotator cuff in a way that is comprehensive because I'm going, you know, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, rather than one, 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 
if that makes sense because it's almost like it's almost like if it's all spirals right how many straight lines do you need to replicate a spiral you know like 10 maybe you get a very very blurry spiral maybe 100 it starts to be more clear maybe a thousand you can see the spiral right but my brain is like well if if we're working on the premise that you know these forces come in spirals the joint is happiest in spirals then i'm going right to spirals thank you can you guys see the spirals in in the sports oh yeah like, so i have a question Hello? yeah what's up mm -hmm. So you were talking about using the reverse throw as kind of adding diversity to like the stabilizing of that shoulder because they're always kind of doing those forward motions. Do you do that with lots of other athletes? Like these golfers are always golfing on the same side. So they're always like building towards the right, releasing to the left. Do you encourage like diversity? Totally. I think is what I'm trying to ask. Yeah, absolutely. It's the way that I look at it. Um, these athletes are really, really very, very good uh, directionally, right? Like you typically don't have that many switch hitters. You don't have that many people batting or, or pitching from both sides. You definitely don't have any pro golfers uh, golfing on both sides, right? So they're for sure building up um, not just a neurological movement pattern that is honed into one side, but it's also producing muscular and fascial imbalances to, to produce a high level swing on that side. So I definitely take them through um, balancing, not just the reverse motion on the same side, but the same motion on the opposite side. It, like I, I gotta be a little bit clear on that because there's the difference between batting right-handed and swinging right-handed and doing a reverse right-handed. And there's a difference between that and batting forward going left and a reverse from the left so there's almost like four options there's a forward and a backwards on the right and then a forwards and a backwards on the left and i always try to balance as many of those things as i can um just because i, I think that gets the best results mm -hmm. okay thanks for answering that yeah absolutely these are great questions by the way Cool. So let me show you guys um, some other like examples, because I think the more you look at them, uh, the more they become apparent. So uh, let's see, maybe we can do, I think this one will be important because we've seen a couple swings, but um, this is John Morant. I don't know if you guys know him. He's a point guard on the Memphis Grizzlies. Uh, super explosive. He's like, crazy athletic he's got ridiculous uh skill crazy athleticism and just like if you watch his body um in the spirals like he's basically throwing spirals left and right and it's just ridiculous to watch so pretty much we'll start here we'll start with the landing phase on his left leg right so pretty much his whole body is going to be pulled over and supported on this structure right so his whole body currently as it is it's being torqued to this backside right and so what's going to happen is he's going to flip this position and going to land on a similar structure to this one but it's going to be on this side and hopefully it's this structure and not uh not uh, this or how do I do this maybe uh, this structure on his right side because that would produce a knee valgus right and then that's when you have higher risk of blowing out your ACL your MCL your meniscus and you have catastrophic knee injury right, but let's just watch him and see what he does because he's one of the best movers uh, in my opinion right so he's going to untorque all those spirals
and now he's landing on this side and now he's torquing to his right side. Can you guys see that? You can really tell by looking at his back foot and look how much internal rotation he gets in extension of that back foot. Right, so, so that, that's what I mean by throwing spirals. You're throwing spirals from one side of the body going one direction. And then as you go into the next phase of gait, you switch and you throw them back to the other side. And that's exactly what he does here, right? You see how it's like non-linear? He's not running in a perfectly straight line. Uh, even though like going full speed, we can't really tell the difference, but he's actually like swimming from side to side. Right? Just fluid, dynamic, explosive. And, you know, he, he tries to post, posterize people like regularly. It's pretty crazy. Okay, so let's look at it on this one. Um, sorry, Landon, sorry to interrupt. Um, I know it's six o'clock, so if you guys have to head out, go ahead and head out. Um, we'll probably wrap up this video, and then uh, if there's any last-minute questions after that, we can take those also. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I appreciate you guys uh, joining me. I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, if you got to go, I, I won't get my feelings hurt or anything. I, I thank you guys for joining me. Um, okay, so I'll just continue and then I'll, I'll wrap this up. But again, let's look at him basically take this landing structure on his leg, right? And his whole body was rotated to this side to basically get ready for that landing. And then as he lands, he's going to switch and basically rotate to the other side now. And even his back leg in extension will go into internal rotation. It's kind of hard to see right there, but his foot is like this way now, right? And his whole body was rotating this way. Can you guys see that on his, on his now his right leg? As he's leaving the ground, his extended leg will go into internal rotation right there. As his left shoulder becomes, uh, goes back to like accompany that. Right. So, you know, it's the same movement pattern as the baseball swing. It's the same movement pattern as the golf swing. It's the same movement pattern as um running as throwing a football um because this is all uh biomechanics and optimal uh optimal this is the optimal path for the energy to basically flow off the body but yeah hopefully that makes sense to you guys and hopefully uh you could see some of the spirals and it wasn't too confusing um but yeah, that, that'll pretty much be it. I have a lot of these videos. Um, if you guys would like me to share them with you another time, um, I can do that or you can just reach out to me and, I, and I'll, I'll show you a lot of them. Definitely. Thank you so much, Landon. Um, we do have one last minute question in the, in the chat, if you mind just going over that briefly. Um, yeah, absolutely. So Chris, Chris is asking, what about track sprinters who seem to run linearly? Yeah, um, we study a lot of, um, you know, Usain Bolt track sprinters, a lot of track and field. And if you actually look at it in slow motion, their center of mass is traveling in a straight line. But from the right leg to the left leg, they get to the right leg from the left leg in a, in a spiraling arc. And they kind of bounce from the left to the right, to the left, to the right. Um, so in full speed, 
it's so many things are happening so fast. It's hard to really tell what's going on. But if you look at them in slow motion video and you just slow it down frame by frame by frame by frame, um, you'll, you'll see that they're actually not moving in straight lines. And especially the best ones, Usain Bolt, he's definitely not moving in straight lines. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, Dr. Cal, I don't know if you, do you mind if I share your, your email or um, if there's anything, if anybody has any questions or if they're interested to go check out some of the courses and videos um, you have, you mind if I just send that information out? Yeah, totally. That, okay. That'd be great. Okay, perfect. Um, awesome. So all of you guys who signed up on the sheet, I'll send an email out with all of uh, Dr. Cow's information. And uh, yeah, thank you again so much. I think uh, I know this is just the tip of the iceberg, but I think it's a good, uh, it's a good start. Um, so yeah, I mean, I really appreciate you coming out. You're super welcome. I appreciate you, Victor. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. And thank you guys for taking time out of your day. And uh, I hope you guys crush it on finals and your uh, practical. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Cal. Thank you, Dr. Cal. You're super welcome. Yeah, feel free to contact me or... or uh,